This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome in, everybody, to this week's edition of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast. I'm your host, Adam the Jock Straczynski. On today's show, the SummerSlam card is shaping up. We've got some details on that. We've got a major AEW injury that's going on. And this Bloodline family member booted from TikTok. We're going to get into all of that later on in the show. Of course, we're going to take a look at what's going on in the wonderful world of wrestling. We've got a pay-per-view to break down that had some awesome, awesome action. We're going to get right into it. Doing it with me, as always, is the one, the only, the Doc, John Macaroon. What's up, cuz? Great week of wrestling, huh? It was fabulous. Highlighted by Money in the Bank. I thought the European crowd was great. I thought that the surprises were epic. I enjoyed it top to bottom. I think a lot of people walked away going, you know, 3 p.m. premium live events is not bad. You get out of it by 5.30 and you can go about your day. But uh, I just really am excited to do this podcast. It's a lot of fun, man, when wrestling is good. And still, there's some things you can critique and look at because I thought for me, you know, obviously we're going to start with the Money in the Bank pay-per-view, but I thought SmackDown was highlighted by one beautiful segment, but then they treated the other superstars as if they were like jobbers. I just cannot believe that you would have AJ Styles and Karrion Cross fight for maybe five minutes and not even show their entrances. Mm-hmm. I just felt SmackDown totally was like, we have an angle, and then we have everybody else, and it just felt like everything was de-emphasized. So it was crazy to see how SmackDown rolled out as compared to how they've done it in the past. But in regards to Money in the Bank, I loved it, top to bottom. Obviously, some things I was pissed off with, highlighted by the fact that our guy didn't win it, but I thought overall... For the intended consequences of saying, hey, was it an entertaining pay-per-view with the great wrestling? Yeah, Money in the Bank delivered, and it was an A+. And again, European crowd, London crowd loved it, and they were all up into their own fields and doing their own thing, which makes an event really special. Yeah, this was probably one of WWE's best premium live events or or pay-per-views that we've had in a long time. This one, top to bottom. I felt like it was great. It left you with stories coming out. It told great stories inside the ring. I thought top to bottom, this was a really fun card. This was a really enjoyable pay-per-view. Had me hooked from the very, very beginning. And we kicked it off with the men's Money in the Bank ladder match. This, this match had a bunch of different competitors with a bunch of different skill sets. And everybody got a moment to shine. Everybody got their spot. It was great, I thought. I thought this match overall did a great job putting everybody over, allowing everybody the opportunity to get over. Now, Damian Priest ends up winning the money in the bank, but I think the one thing you should take out of this after watching this match, L.A. Knight is one of the most over guys in WWE right now. L.A. Knight is white hot. And the fact that Damian Priest ends up winning it, it tells you what WWE thinks about Damian Priest and where they view him in the in the hierarchy of of talent that they have, but L.A. Knight right now they need to strap a rocket to his back at some point soon because we've seen this before. When they just let it run its course, when it's organic like this and it runs its course, it is great. You go back to Kofi Mania. That's probably the most recent where we've had a superstar just organically get over. That was supposed to be Mustafa Ali's time. Instead, Kofi Mania ran wild for what seemed like a year and a half. And then all of a sudden, Brock Lesnar put it out in eight seconds. You've got a guy in L.A. Knight that the fans are so behind. And this guy is supposed to be a heel, but the fans are so far behind him. Even when a guy like Kevin Nash, a, a Hall of Fame wrestler, comes out and, and kind of degrades what L.A. Knight does, the fans even lash out at him and tell him to sit down and shut up. So at some point, WWE has to make a decision on what they're doing with L.A. Knight because they're going to let this Peter buy. And when it does, it's going to be hard to recapture the same thing. Damian Priest wins it. I'm okay with this. I thought it was, I thought it was a, a, a solid second choice to go over. I feel, still feel like LA Knight should have been the guy. Are you okay with Damian Priest being the one who went over instead of LA Knight? Because that was both of our guy. 
Yeah, it was unbelievable because they teased that LA Knight was going to win it, and the crowd yep. was into it. Everybody thought it was going to happen, only to have Damian Priest. Now, you know, based on who's the bigger star right now, the bigger star in the eyes of the company is Damian Priest, which we've talked about and documented that they feel like they want to put the rocket strip to uh, the 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 strap to him and give him a push too. So I, I I guess in the spirit of what Money in the Bank is, it makes sense. Obviously, we didn't consider that Seth is a face, and it's going to be tough when the crowd is really really into LA Knight to have two faces. They've done it before, but it makes sense given the fact that it was Finn Balor in the main event of Money in the Bank. I didn't like it. I just think that, you know, I understand it. I understand the reasoning. You have a heel. You have a character in Damian Priest that also now factors in the layers with the Judgment Day. But for me, I just felt like you, you didn't even have to address having LA Knight having money in the bank for six months. The dude could walk around with that thing for six months. They could have two title changes before LA Knight could potentially even have to address thinking about cashing it in. He could say, I'm going to soak this baby in. This is a championship baby. He could have made that thing <clears throat> even more special. So I understand why they didn't do it. LA Knight's over. He's going to have opportunities and maybe starting with the U.S. title or starting with a, a different belt. But uh, man, LA Knight, uh, the cry, like if you see, if you go back and watch it, which is always good, when he walks out, even he's like, what the hell is going on here? Yep. He's like, it, it's it, his it, reaction from the crowd has even shocked him at times. It's it, crazy. You're absolutely right. It's jarring for a character. You're like, OK, yeah, I've been popular. But to have a crowd give you a stone cold type reception was pretty awesome for him to see. And uh, the crowd made him feel important. And every de performer deserves that, especially with all the work that he's done. No, you're absolutely right. And we take a look at our, our next match, which is Liv Morgan, Raquel Gonzalez, taking on Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler for the WWE Women's Tag Team Championships. Now, I don't know if you had a tip on this. I don't know if you knew something I didn't know. I didn't see this happening at all. What ended up taking place was probably one of the more confusing moments of a nine-minute match that I've ever seen. Uh, Rousey ends up doing a blind tag with Baszler, jumps in the ring, and is just working over Liv Morgan. Next thing you know, Shayna Baszler comes in and blindsides Ronda Rousey and allows Liv Morgan and Raquel Gonzalez to end up defeating them and taking on the WWE Women's World Tag Team Championships. And we now have new tag team champs and Liv Morgan and Raquel Gonzalez. This was weird to me because when I watched this, I was like, I don't, I don't understand. Like, this didn't make any sense to me. You find out the backstory later on and you understand that Ronda Rousey has a hard out date. And she wants to do this angle with Shayna Baszler. And because of her forearm injury that she was dealing with months prior, the timeline kind of got shortened and they just kind of sped things up. It, it, it was weird because you had different information coming out. You had Rousey and Shayna Baszler in all these reports talking about how they wanted to really elevate these women tag team championships. And then they really only hold them for what, maybe less than a month. And then they drop them to the previous champs. So it was a little bit jarring, a little bit concerning, I didn't necessarily understand it. I kind of get it now. I think the Rousey Shayna Baszler feud could be great. I want to kind of get your perspective on all of this. Was this a shock to you? Because you had this, you had this one pegged. This is what won you uh, the calling the card segment of our show. You picked Liv Morgan and Ra Raquel Gonzalez to end up defeating Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler. To me, this was completely shocking. I did not see this coming from ten miles away. What was your reaction when this happened? Were you shocked by it? Were you were you surprised at how it played out? Because to me, it left me scratching the head. I was like, I just I did not see this. Yeah, it was obviously it was something that I felt like WWE would do because the champs never really lost the title. When it comes to injuries, you got to factor that in a little bit. Like, hey, uh, Liv Morgan and Raquel, they're on their way up, and so how when I and I think the interesting part is now that you said that. How would Ronda and Shayna Baszler elevate other tag teams? It isn't going to be in the ring with them. Let's be honest. They're not going to put on bangers. They're not going to be a world-class team. The only way they can do it is to give them a belt. That's about it, When I, just to be frank. Look, Shayna Baszler and Ronda Rousey have uh, friendship chemistry and things like that, but them holding a title is not going to be meaningful. So I think that them losing 
they get a little bit, uh, Raquel and Liv get a little bit of the rub, and you pivot directly into the next feud. So that's smart by WWE. Um, obviously, it was shocking because, yeah, even in the way in which it was revealed, it was like, okay, Shayna's getting pissed, and all of a sudden she starts beating down her own opponent, so her, her own teammate. So it was kind of shocking in the way in which they just unlo- uh, they, they launched it out there. And it just kind of came out of nowhere, which was surprising. But it was exciting for me because I was like, oh, all right, I, this, this is how they do it. Yes, the new feud is interesting. And look, Ronda has a heart out. Great. That's how you're really going to really uh, establish yourself in this career that you have is just to kind of come in and come out. So in, in the end, uh, from that information, I'm not going to invest all that much in, in, in Ronda Rousey. This is an opportunity. It's clear as day that you have to... Um, find a way to make Shayna Baszler look like a badass so she can be a prominent figure in the women's division. Yeah, it, look, I think when she came out and she cut that promo on Monday Night Raw, it was a very raw, I think it was a very real promo. She was basically speaking from a fan perspective, and I thought it was great. I thought it was really, really good. I think this has the opportunity to kind of put Shayna Baszler over and make her that badass that she was in NXT. If you if she can come out of this this feud with Ronda Rousey and she's a badass like she was in NXT, I think Ronda Rousey has done her job. She can ride off into the sunset. It's all said and done. It's fine. We can move on because Shayna Baszler in NXT was interesting. Shayna Baszler in NXT was a badass. Shayna Baszler in NXT was feared. She was great. The way that they had built that character was absolutely amazing. Ronda Rousey has been really anything but in WWE. It's it's been this weird. It's just been a very weird relationship. So if she can, on her way out, elevate Shayna Baszler, cool. You did your job, and we can move on. Still very surprising that they did it this way. And again, it was there were other things going on behind the scenes that not many of us knew about. So uh, very, very weird. Uh, Gunther ends up defeating Matt Riddle to retain the WWE Championship. Drew McIntyre shows up. We had other guys showing up on this card that we thought. Drew McIntyre was not one. Drew McIntyre shows up. And he is back and wants a piece of Gunther. Now, I know you are a huge fan of Gunther. I know you do like Drewy Mac. What are your thoughts on these two getting together, possibly at SummerSlam, for the WWE Intercontinental Championship? Ooh, premium. Premium feud. I thought it was great. I thought it was great timing. Whisper started that day, I guess, online, which is good for me because I, I wasn't surfing it. I wasn't doing the whole dirt sheet. So I was genuinely surprised. I thought it was great. I thought that, oh, I like it. And I know sometimes people need time away and they, they, they handle business, clear up injuries, but Drew McIntyre looked like a different dude. Like just for whatever reason, his aura because of the crowd, maybe he looked like the star that he belonged and he, it was perfect to stand right across from Gunther. And I thought that they presented him very well. I thought that, um, the opportunity to see Drew McIntyre back was spectacular. I felt like, wow, this is a a main event dude and he'll have an opportunity but uh, it's going to be tough because I just don't think Gunther's ready to lose it yet. I think that um, both will have the opportunity to benefit from this feud. But uh, whew, Drew coming back, he deserves a nice run and a nice opportunity. And this buildup should be special. Yeah, it should be special. This should be a really good, interesting feud between the two. Uh, it sounds like reports on Drew McIntyre doesn't sound like he's necessarily re-signed his contract. I know contract dispute was a was something that was questioned for a little bit. Doesn't sound like that's been done. It sounds like with all the time he's taken off for injury, they've kind of extended his contract out. Uh, so he's not coming due until sometime later on in 2024. All that being said, it sounds like the big holdup with Drew McIntyre coming back was he wasn't a real fan of the creative for his character, and he wanted something substantial. Sounds like he's going to get that with this Gunther match. We'll see what takes place. Uh, Cody Rhodes ends up defeating Dominic Mysterio. Real quick question. Did this feel like a squash match to you? Because when I watched it, I didn't necessarily feel like it was a squash match. But Dominic did get a little bit manhandled in this. So I was just kind of curious what you what you thought about this. <laughs> I thought it was the worst match on the card. I thought it was, it was the worst match on the card. I thought it Absolutely. was crazy. I was like, how is this a possibility? This is something that you have these performers and you have two dudes that potentially could have a special match. And that wasn't the case at all. Luckily, it wasn't the main event. So I think maybe Michael Cole was talking and kind of got his words jumbled because when I saw it, I'm like, okay, yeah, this is fine. And in, in, in the placement of the card uh, in, in where this match took place, the crowd was definitely into Cody Rhodes. But my God, what is it? It just wasn't a good match. I was really surprised. But coming on the heels of the matches that were there in totality on the card, I guess 
It just was an opportunity for the fans to cheer Cody Rhodes. It was nothing more, nothing less. And I just didn't think, for the purpose of what you could have did, Dominic didn't get the rub that you needed. Yeah, I, I don't know what they were necessarily trying to do. I don't know what the outcome or the goal of this match was. Uh, besides letting the fans sing one of the better entrance songs of of the WWE uh, themes that they have in Cody Rhodes. Um, really, I don't think this really helped Dominic Mysterio. I don't think it necessarily helped Cody Rhodes. Uh, if Brock Lesnar would have came out, and we could have got this story moved along. Instead, we got that on Monday Night Raw. If we could have got that, I, I think then you're kind of like, all right, cool. You feel a little bit different about it. Instead, we got a match. It was what it was. We get to move on to the women's Money in the Bank match, which this, I think, was one of the best women's Money in the Bank matches we've had ever. I thought this was great. I thought the ending of this was fantastic. I thought this was done to perfection. I, I wanted to get your, your interpretation. Io Sky wins the women's Money in the Bank match in what I believe is one of the most fantastic endings. Does her chase... For whichever title it's going to be, does it interest you? Because I was excited when she won, but then I start thinking about how WWE programs, and I was like, I don't know if I want to see her chasing Rhea Ripley. I don't know if I want to see her chasing Asuka. And, and legit, I think her and Asuka could do great work together, but the promos to build that would be very, very hard. So I'm wondering if her winning the Money in the Bank ladder match her winning the the actual briefcase does that chase get you interested in the women's side of things does it get you interested in the women's uh championship whether it's on raw or whether it's on smackdown see it's real interesting and i circled this on the sheet and i said you know i'm just not for whatever reason i'm not into the eos guy character i don't know what the deal is she's great the crowd likes her she's fluid she's got everything that you think uh a performer has, but I don't know if they just have done enough to shine the WWE light on her enough to make her be like, wow, she's special. Or just maybe it's just my personal taste. I'm just really right now into Rhea. I'm into um, what she's been doing with her character. And the other women that are potentials uh, up and comers just aren't there yet. And I know now EO will be given the opportunity. I think the work will be done now. And I, obviously we saw her on SmackDown. But I look at it and I say, when you have... Natalia gets squashed and you have uh, Asuka. It just looks like it's just the big four and not every, and nothing else. And, and, and it's more of a focus on the tag teams. And I think that's where WWE has really flopped is that they haven't done enough to elevate the women in the mid card. Um, for whatever reason, you know, EO Sky, obviously talented, obviously somebody that the crowd gravitates towards. Me personally, just not there yet with it. But in terms of who, yeah, I just... I, I think that it does kind of seem like she's being served up to whoever the champ's going to be. I don't see a potential title run in her. And, uh, you know, maybe it'll be against Asuka if that's the case. But uh, in, in the end, you, you got to do a better job of developing these ladies because it's, it's just not, it's not there yet for me, at least. Yeah, I, I don't think they've done a great job with a lot of the storylines that surround the women, uh, specifically – uh, even the champion, Rhea Ripley. I don't think they've done a great job with with her storyline. So EO Sky now getting this. Again, I like the character. I was more into her NXT character than yeah. I am into her main roster character. And I think that has something to do with just her being paired with Bailey. I don't think it necessarily works. But that being said, I thought this was a great match. I thought the ending was awesome. Her winning, I was pumped for. What comes next they've got to figure something out to really get me excited and to really get me to buy in because I'm not excited for, for her chase. It, it just, to me, it just doesn't feel like it's going to work. And it's just because of how WWE books things. If we go back to EO sky, basically talking Japanese and you giving us subtitles. I'm cool with it. Uh, if you don't, the promos are going to be tough and the promos help sell matches. You you've had Cody Rhodes and you've had Seth Rollins and you've had some of the other stars build matches without ever touching just just words, just verbiage. And it's worked, and it's been great. She has to be physical to end up selling her match. So we'll see what ends up taking, what takes place with this. Uh, Seth Rollins defeats Finn Balor to retain the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. A little bit of, uh, a little bit of funny stuff on the outside. Damian Priest obviously wins, comes out, distracts Finn Balor, Finn and... and uh, Damian Priest end up getting quite upset. We're going to talk a little bit about what transpires from this on Monday Night Raw. 
Um, thought it was a really good match. This set up our main event. The Usos end up defeating Roman Reigns and Solo Sokoa. I thought this was an outstanding match. I thought the final 10 minutes had me hooked, and I love the conclusion of this match. I want to get your take on what you thought about this match because I thought they did a, such a good job basically selling everything. This, this, this told such a good story, and it, it pulled from so much that has happened in the past, from a ref, ref bump to Roman winning after a ref bump to, to uh, a spear and a spike and guys not getting up to these guys actually getting up after this. Uh, you go back to uh, when Jay and Roman faced each other. Uh, Jay had Roman covered. Roman ended up kicking out with a with a shot to the groin as he lifted his shoulder up and punched uh, punched upwards. Jay did the same thing to Roman in this match. Like there was so much nuance in this match, it was unreal. Like you've had to have been paying attention for the last couple of years to really get a lot of the subtle details. What did you make of this match, and what did you think of the conclusion of the match? Ooh, it was special. Um, obviously, they played up the fact that Roman hasn't been pinned, and I thought the multiple false finishes, the crowd being taken through this story, made it spectacular. It was a beautiful story that they told in the ring, and I just thought that it was a great great way to continue to elevate others in your show because you know roman's the shit he knows what's going on solo is the man he acclimated himself well it it lived up to the billing it was an amazing main event it made the card it made the show special it took you on a wild journey and everybody was gripping man everybody was like what's gonna happen what's gonna what's gonna go down here and i just thought that wow when you have a nice wrestling match that delivers and when you have roman really kind of letting all his rub and energy go off into the Usos, it, it, make, it makes them a bigger star, and that's what the, the whole purpose has been. And it's great, obviously, when a plan comes together. This has been what WWE's want. I mean, we talked about Jay and uh, Roman for a long time, and now it's come to fruition. And sometimes, even though you may know what's coming, the path is still very, very special. And wow, wow. it's great. It's, it's a great match that really ranks up there for the year in terms of quality. It delivered. And it made it feel like a big deal that, hey, Roman got pinned. Now, in the context of a tag team, okay, I, I understand it's not going to have reverberating uh, effects for Roman. Obviously, they, they furthered the story on SmackDown in regards to what now is next. And they found a way to tie into what's next after this. And th this is what it's going to become. And it's going to be really cool to see. But the question I guess I got to ask you is, is this as good as, as the involvement with Sammy? Is Usos... Civil War, as good as the drama we got with Sammy. I think it's a close second, but not there yet. And I think it's because Sammy started off just like 10% more popular than the Usos were. And so it took them into the stratosphere of we actually could consider the opportunity for Sammy Zayn to do something here uh, to potentially get the pin and do something. But it wasn't him. They saved the pin for the family. They kept it in the family. But uh, it's just not as good. It, it's good, A minus, A plus, A if you want to say it. But Sammy and Kevin, it, it, I think it just had more of an emotional tie for me at least. I think at, at a certain point, this storyline has it, it's done a good job of trying to keep keep it on the track because I feel like at any given point, you've got to remember this storyline is is almost two and a half years old. At any given point, this storyline could have fell off the tracks really, really hard. I think at this point, we've kind of seen so much and you've been involved for so long. It gets to a little bit of a, of a point where you're just kind of like almost numb to things, right? Like you've seen it all. Like you've seen yeah. all this stuff that, that, the Us that the Usos are going through. You've seen it all with Sami Zayn. That was your first view of it. Yeah. This is now the second time you're seeing it. So I think at a certain point, it just doesn't hit the same because you've already experienced it once. That being said, I am interested to see the, the journey for – the Usos, I'm interested to see the journey specifically for Jay. Uh, and I, I think there is a, a wild card in all of this, and that is Solo Sokoa. And we're going to talk a little bit about what took place on SmackDown uh, coming up here in a few moments on the show. Because I think there's a lot that they can do with Solo. And I think Solo is the key to whatever this next and maybe final chapter is in this Bloodline storyline. So we'll get into all of that right now. Uh, I'm calling the card. You ended up getting the point. You grabbed it with the Liv and Raquel Ooh. win. Uh, you hold a two-point lead over me. It's three and a half to five and a half. 
I want to jump into into Money in the Bank, and then we're going to circle back to uh, to SmackDown with with what took place on SmackDown regarding the the Tribal Chiefs trial. Um, to me, the way that that this pay per view set up, it gave you a a main event that carried over into Monday's show with Seth Rollins and Finn Balor and Damian Priest. And it gave you a main event that carried over into Friday's show with SmackDown with with the Bloodline and the Trial of the Tribal Chiefs. So I thought the way the pay-per-view laid out, this really set up your programming going forward, which I always love. It always gives you a little bit of a cliffhanger to come back to the next day. And that's what this gave you. The Judgment Day, obviously, is splintering very, very soon. And it's going to either be Finn or it's going to be Damian that will be standing tall. Who do you feel should be the unquestioned leader? I think that they've done a really nice job of telling a bit of a story with with Dominic Mysterio where basically he doesn't have a dad anymore. He He's excommunicated Ray, right? So now his dads, his father figures are Finn Balor and they're Damian Priest. Well, now his two dads are fighting and Rhea Ripley and Damian or Rhea Ripley and Dominic, the people that they look to as the leaders of this group they're now kind of going on and having their own internal civil war, having their own internal fight, and there will be a split soon, and they will have to pick sides. Who do you feel should be the unquestioned leader of the Judgment Day at this time? Man, because it's crazy. You can make an argument for both. You could say that Damian yep. Priest could go on his Again, own. and be really be, good storytelling, right? Like yes. this, is, this, this to me is one of the best storylines on Monday Night Raw right now. Yes, because Damian Priest could go on to be a star and carry his own thing. And you could think that Finn naturally could lead a faction, but I think the way it's going to go is Damian Priest is, you know, obviously was part of the original Judgment Day, and I think that he's the perfect person to lead Rhea, Dominic, and you move on from Finn Balor. Finn Balor, I think, can go on and have many more feuds on Monday Night Raw, and you could spend a few months feuding with two people. You can go four months and, and feud with Dominic and feud with uh, Damian Priest. And it'll be interesting to see how it continues to play out as Finn gets pissed that he missed out on his opportunities to win. And uh, it's crazy in that, you know, Damian now gets pissed that he had an opportunity to cash in and he was right there. I didn't think I didn't believe that he was actually going to do it. You could see the swerve coming from a mile away, but it was good to yep. actually play out on television to see now why you're you're now getting the why as to why these two leaders of the Judgment Day are going to feud. Yeah, most definitely. Again, I thought it was a really nice, just kind of a really nice tidbit what you got. You, Like you said, you could see it coming a mile away, but again, just to be able to see it all kind of unfold on screen, I thought was absolutely fantastic. thought it was really, really good. Again, I feel this is the most interesting storyline on Monday Night Raw. Are you in that camp? Do you feel like this is one of the best things that Monday Night Raw has going for it? Yep, absolutely. Outside of uh, Seth Rollins, uh, it, it's amazing. It's 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 interesting. It's intriguing, and obviously Cody Rhodes and Brock will eventually pop off and, and get to that level too. Yeah, most definitely. And, and look, speaking of Cody Rhodes and, and Brock, I thought the way that they kind of set that angle up, where Cody Rhodes got the upper hand on Brock Lesnar, I thought that was interesting. I feel like at this point in Brock's career, he's more open to doing the job for a lot of different guys if he feels they're worthy, and I think he feels Cody's worthy. This is something that I don't think we would have seen in the past. I don't think we would have seen uh, Brock Lesnar getting upper handed by Cody. This is in a, in a build to a match that is roughly a month away. What, what was your take on that? Like, do you feel like like I think we both believe that that Cody Rhodes is winning at, at SummerSlam. Cody Rhodes is going to get the win. And he's going to be able to move on. They've got to have their best of three. He'll end up winning two to one. Uh, and I think he gets that. But. Were you shocked that on Monday Night Raw, in one of the few appearances that Brock Lesnar makes, he comes out and he basically kind of gets put in his place? Like, was that was that weird to you? Because I seen that and I was like, interesting. Like, like Brock is obviously open to doing the job, which is great because that used to not be a thing with Brock Lesnar. I read a story about how he went over to New Japan and he basically held the IWGP belt hostage for a year and a half <laughs> living in Saskatoon. So, like, like Brock Lesnar back in the day was not a very good guy. Yeah. So I'm not saying he's a great guy now, but back in the day he was definitely a dick. Yeah, I mean, how could you not respect Cody Rhodes? When you see the man wrestle injured in front of the whole wide world and you see the work that he did to come back 
and you see an over character. Look, Brock sees dollar signs, and that's what motivates him. And he's like, I don't care. If I can make some money and have three matches with the dude and, and uh, further my career in my mid-40s, hell yeah. Whatever you want, baby. <laughs> he's like, I'm all for it. And uh, it'll be special. Yes, Cody's going to go over. Brock will take his hiatus, and we'll move on our business. It doesn't. It didn't need to happen. I mean, it's great for Cody to get Brock under the belt, to get the rub of being in the ring with him. But it's just like, still, it, they would have benefited from a little bit of why. I mean, I don't respect you is not really good enough in regards to this. They could have at least been creative and figured out a way, like something that happened 10 years ago that they could weave in or explain or do a video with it and say, hey, this is what I got pissed off at and I'm coming for revenge or I don't feel like you you deserve this spot or whatever. You could have said something, but they're fighting, they're feuding. It'll be a great pop-worthy moment at SummerSlam and uh, Cody's going to go over. He'll get his pop and he'll get his opportunity. So again, I understand that Cody now is, is building his... For us, like we're like, dude, you don't need to build your resume in WWE, but yeah, that's what he's doing. Absolutely. He's building his resume so that at WrestleMania 40, uh, when the opportunity comes or whenever he gets his time to finish his story, it has more of a meaningful background on his wrestling resume that he beat uh, <laughs> that he beat um, Brock Lesnar. But I did think it was interesting to see because they had him come out uh, against early in Raw against Seth Rollins. And I'm like, well... That is kind of telling the same story. It's not really finishing the story. Uh -huh. if, if he were to win the world title, I don't think it has the same meaning as the person who will take the – the person basically that wins the title off of Roman will be the next guy, will have literally the rocket rocket ship strapped to them. And is that going to be Cody? We all hope it is, but we can't assume it. But at this point, at least we can say, well, maybe going 4-0 against Seth down the road could do something. But – you know, uh, we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. I, I would assume now that you start and saying, okay, at least he would have a beeline to have an opportunity against Seth at some point, and we'll see how it goes. Maybe you even have it where um, because uh, Cody is 3-0 and and now Seth is the champion, you have it at Survivor Series, and, and, and Seth wins. And again, you now add to the, whoa, it's never, it, it's, 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 it's the internal struggle of Cody. Can he win the big one? Can he finally do something as he keeps failing in his big moment opportunities? Big match, Cody can't handle it. And then he finally does it at, uh, at, at, <laughs> at, at WrestleMania. But, you know, we'll see how it plays out. It'll all be interesting. You know, it's, I feel like that's, that storyline him getting into big matches and just kind of failing and, and then finally overcomes it. I feel like that is a, a more, I don't know if accurate is the right word, but I feel like that would probably be a better story than he needs to go through adversity. Right. This man wrestled in a match where his, basically his right tit was ripped off the bone and it was freaking, it looked like it was, he had like blueberry sauce all over the one half of his body. Cause it was so bruised and filled with blood. Like, I don't know how much more adversity this man needs. I don't right. know what else he's got to do to show that he's kind of a badass and he loves the business. So, like, I feel like your storyline that you just proposed would probably make more sense. It would probably be better because they were like, oh, he needs adversity. Like, my man wrestled an entire match, one-armed, and he had no chest muscle because it was basically gone. What are we talking about here? Like, I just the, – the, sometimes it just doesn't make sense. WWE logic, it's what it is. Speaking of WWE logic, we had the trial of the tribal chief, and that resulted in a beatdown of Jimmy Uso. Jimmy Uso got his ass whipped on this episode of SmackDown. I thought this was, was really great. This led to an enraged Jay who left the building and went to a medical facility. Again, WWE terminology. Went to a medical facility with his brother, but returned. I want to know what you think about this addition to the storyline because what we got on SmackDown – I thought was was really awesome. It kind of gave you a little bit of a glimpse and it teased Solo Sokoa, and they've been doing this for a couple of weeks now, Solo Sokoa basically taking over the reins of head of the table. You got a little bit of it on the lead up uh, with, the, with the Usos where they both tipped their cap and said that they don't want to be the tribal chief and that they feel that Solo should be the tribal chief. And then at the, um, at the pay-per-view, uh, on the premium live event during the match, Roman obviously getting frustrated, Roman having difficulties in the match and kind of shutting down almost, almost losing 
what what his what focus he had in solo being like no this is what we need to do and taking charge of the situation to continue the beatdown on the usos before roman gets pinned and look roman was the one who got pinned in that match it wasn't solo to then what we got on friday again follow along stay with me to what we got on friday where you had roman basically put the lay on uh jay uso and crowned him uh the new tribal chief only to a uh, low blow him, and this leads to a brawl. This leads to a fight. The lay ends up falling in the middle of the ring, and they did this whole Lord of the Rings ring of power type of storyline with it where you have Solo pick up the lay, and he's looking at it, and it's almost like he's having these thoughts. He's having this conversation with the lay, like, I could put this on, and I am now the tribal chief. I deserve this. I should do this. I'm the guy. I am the chosen one. He's not the chosen one only for Roman to stand up and him to kind of snap back out of it and snap back into reality and give the lay back to Roman. I thought this was incredible storytelling. And I think it's giving you a glimpse where this is headed. And I think it's, it's, it's all foreshadowing. I think this is fantastic storytelling and, and just kind of what they're doing is they're adding again at any point in two and a half years, this story could have went wildly awry. They've done a great job of keeping it on the tracks and getting us to a destination. I feel like the destination kind of keeps changing, but they're doing a really good job of keeping everything moving forward and giving you more and giving you more. And sometimes they'll give you, they'll dump a whole bucket on you. And other times they'll give you a a few crumbs and and every now and then you'll just get a piece of bread with it. But this has been done so well. And I thought what we got on SmackDown really helped continue a lot of this along and really helped add a new layer to this. And I think when all this is said and done, what is going to happen is Jimmy and Jay were already stars. Jimmy and Jay throughout the course of this have been elevated. Roman Reigns, obviously, he is the top dog in WWE. He is the guy. But I think when it's all said and done, you are going to have a new star. And he might be a mega star in Solo Sokoa. And I think that might be the whole point of this two and a half year storyline that has been so freaking incredible is to make solo Sokoa. W- w- what do you think about that? Yeah. And it's believable and it's really good. And you have, again, a continuation and you have a bridge and you have, uh, interwoven with that, the fact that he's brothers with, with the Usos, the fact that he's this, this, this really enforcer type dude that potentially could be a leader, you know, it, it would be crazy, you know, in regards to how everything goes. But, man, because they carried it for a half an hour at Madison Square Garden. That's just the biggest highlight, the biggest compliment is they didn't even have, yeah. a, they didn't have a match. They were talking. That's what I said. Like, I, I sat there and I looked at the time. And I was like, this just went on for 35 minutes. Yep. I was like, oh, my God, this is awesome. Like, I didn't even like no commercials, no nothing. 35 minutes uninterrupted. Yep. And it was great. And it was perfect. And it was great. And it was a great way to kick off the show. This is cinema, baby. And it was very good, very, very much so in line with what WWE has been doing. And thankfully, it was executed well. And I love, you know, for me, it's always great. I think it's underrated to hook some dude into the ropes and watch him get his brother beat. I thought that was cool. I I I thought it was cool. You know, it was always good with, uh, you know, other performers back in the day. It was it was it was great and uh, man it was it was crazy to see uh, for a second but it, it was funny Roman overacted a little bit and uh, you know but when he did the uh, the crotch shot there that was classic and it was a great the classic heel turn and uh, everything was solid and I thought even having Solo shut up Paul Heyman was special too to start to yeah. to see him start to enforce his will so all good baby uh, but after that SmackDown took a, it just took a nosedive and it was crazy uh-huh. to see it was like they ascended into perfect. Uh, cruising altitude and then once the segment ended boom it was it was done it was a wrap the rest of smackdown was basically filler yeah it was weird because like you said you've got a guy like aj styles uh taking on a guy like carrying cross not really given a lot of time that match was over just kind of as it was as i was getting into it and like you said you didn't really get the intros the intros were kind of cut i was really surprised we came back and carrying cross was in the ring there, there was a lot of stuff that I don't know if that segment ran extra long and they're like, look, we got a cut because um, that happens sometimes. So I'm not sure if that segment ran incredibly long and they knew what they needed to do at the end. So everybody else kind of got pinched and they're like, we got to go fast now. And that sometimes makes for a disjointed show when your opening segment runs again. It was 35 minutes long. That's a long opening segment. And then on the back end of that, I think you had. 
the final 10 or maybe 15 minutes of the program. So if you look at it as a whole, they got almost 50, almost 50 minutes to work. They got almost a whole hour to tell this story. So everybody else is basically getting an hour and 10 minutes. Plus you have to factor in all of the commercials because now the commercials get pu- pushed back and backed up on. So it becomes a very disjointed show. So I totally get what you're saying. And it was kind of weird the way it ended up coming out as far as a television program. Um, it was, I don't think it was the, I don't think it was the best, I, the, the best ran SmackDown, right? If you talk about right. from a show running perspective, I don't think it was the, the best ran, uh, the best show ran edition of SmackDown. But I think what you got meat and potatoes wise, storyline wise, I thought it was incredible. I thought it added more nuance and it added another layer to this story. And I thought that was great. Uh, let's get into some AEW because there's been some stuff about Collision that have been coming out. And I, I guess the the big question I have for you is, can AEW afford low ratings for Collision? This is a show that they've made a very big deal about. This is a show that TBS has come to them and said, or actually Warner Brothers Discovery has come to them and said, here you go. We're giving you two more hours on, on Saturday night. We want you to make this thing as big as dynamite. Do what you got to do. And for a minute, it really felt like Collision was going to get a, a ton of money and a ton of effort to, to really make it in a, a maybe the number one show, to make it the A-plus show. Um, it doesn't seem like very early on it's been able to grab that foothold. Ratings lately have been on par with Rampage, and we all know how we feel about Rampage. I, I Look, last on, on Saturday night, you had uh, CM Punk defeat Samoa Joe. I don't think anybody was surprised by that. I thought that that the show was was okay. Um, I'm going to be speak very frank and very honest with you. I this is not appointment viewing for me. I really don't have any ambitions to sit down on a Saturday night at the end of the week and watch another two hours of wrestling. Uh, it also doesn't help that this program is centered around CM Punk, and we all know how I feel about CM Punk. So it makes a bit difficult for me to watch sometimes but all that being said i don't know if aew can afford to 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 handle this to to be able to take this on if these ratings don't turn around and i'm not sure how they how they turn the ratings for this because i think it is a bit of a difficult time slot like i know saturday wrestling works and it has worked in the past but i don't know if saturday wrestling in prime time necessarily works with the demographic that you're looking to carry it, it's generally the, the, these, this wrestling show, what, 8 to 10 is when it runs? I, look, when I was 18 to, to, to 35, that's a demo that they want to win. I was out. I was going to dinner. I was out at the bar. I was doing things. There were things going on. If it didn't rain on, on Saturday night, I would have been down at a, at, a, uh, uh, at a social district drinking and listening to live music because that would be more entertaining to me than watching Saturday Night Wrestling with CM Punk. Just – Telling you how it is. So I don't know if they can handle this. I think at, at a certain point, this is something that AEW does. AEW programs to their audience. They don't counter-program. WWE does a good job of counter-programming where they're trying to, to bury AEW. AEW is like, we're just going to do our own thing. We're going to program to our audience. We're going to program to a smart wrestling fan. I think at some point, and it might be with this show, you've got to start to do some counter-programming. You've got to start to do something that makes people want to turn in and make people say, oh, hey, wait, I, I got to check out what's going to take place on Collision because I don't know – what's going to happen there. It might be something incredible. So I, I say all that to, to, to basically ask you the same question I, I opened with is, is can they afford these low ratings? No. And here's the thing too, a prominent former wrestling announcer, the coach who was uh, doing the announcing for the Detroit rock and mortgage classic from the remote location. He went on there and said, look, I'm not disparaging a company, but I'll say this. When you start off as a company, he's like, look, his thesis was Saturday night wrestling shows don't work. They don't draw. He's like, you aren't even drawing and you're not even competing yet against college football, which is undefeated. And he didn't knock AEW. He just said, knowing from my experience, television ratings and what people watch, they're going to get murdered. And he's like, just looking at the three week trends, collisions ratings went down. Now there's a little bit more of like you know, big time too. Yeah, but but see, AEW countered, and their fans said, "Look, DVR numbers are okay. 
the old Nielsen ways are just really tough to measure, that that uh, this is still very early. Where it's basically a brand new show that's still drawing half a million people. And it's just, you know, the way I look at it is, is this. That's a tough spot. It's, it's, it's just really tough. I, I haven't caught it live once in terms of live, but I DVR it. And I don't know what that metric will do for them. But I'll say this, you know, and FTR said the best thing that they could say. One of them replied and said, look, we're going to do our damnedest to put on the best wrestling show that we can every week. And for our fans that love it, come on board and see what it's all about. And that's what it's going to be. It's going to take time. Uh, Yes, I do think potentially there is maybe a little bit of a reverse backlash against CM Punk being those that, you know, there's a certain segment that do like the Young Bucks. So you fractured the audience. So basically you're getting half of a half in that you would have had a certain amount of an audience on a Saturday, but you cut them because you lost the portion of the AEW fan base that supports the Young Bucks. So inevitably, if you're Tony Khan, you just have to bite the bullet, sit in the room with these fellas and say, Young Bucks, we're going to have your music play on Saturday night at 8.05. Punk's going to be talking about, I'm this, I'm that, and the Young Bucks just stare at, and, and you might even just have to say it. Uh, you know, the, the the encounter you've all been waiting for, Saturday night, 8.05. We all know what that means. You're going to get a million viewers, and you might have to do it, you know, pretty early in the college football season to get this thing rolling. And you have to create new stars, and it takes time. And and, and it, it uh, look, they've been given the opportunity. They're, they're going to have time. The ratings dip is not good over a three-week trend, but it's also because, you know, Let's have Miro. Let's have Andrade. Well, those dudes have been gone for a fucking year. You know, you basically splintered the fan base who doesn't even know who these guys are. And currently, Andrade and Miro are just, you know, uh, CJ's husband and Charlotte's husband. That's where they're at in their careers. And you got to reestablish them as being the big-time dudes. And that's where you're at is that you said, hey, half the audience that forgot who this guy was, remember Andrade? We're like, no. Oh, Okay. Yeah. And you're like, remember Miro? Wasn't he the guy on the tank in WWE? Or doesn't he have a hot-ass wife that's always dancing? Who the hell is this guy? So that's what you got to do. And you got to tell good stories. You got to have good matches. You got to have great moments. And you, you just can't have a show to have a show. You got to create the television. And you got to create some drama. And it's just something w, uh, AEW just hasn't been doing as of late in terms of viral moments. You got to make it so that it's not cookie-cutter Good guy, bad guy, feud. You got to have some, you know, some more of that blurring of the vision here. And probably the best way to do it to start is MJF. You know, start talking about his contract. Start talking about stuff on on uh, Collision and make him a guy that's just featured more on Saturday than he is on Wednesday. Wednesday, you, you got Moxley and Danielson and, and two groups. You could just have the world champ on Saturday. And uh, you just got to do a lot better job because you're absolutely right. Collision, like I said, uh, Last night was more about UFC Saturday than it was about uh, Collision. We were all excited for the matches that the UFC did because of the hype and the two title matches that they had. So I watched UFC, and uh, I caught up with Collision on Sunday morning. Yeah, I look, I, I thought if you had to pick something to watch, it would definitely be UFC. I, I was not into – again, I'm not into the, into Collision. And, and I think you brought up a good point where – these where CM Punk and the elite may have to get together. They may have to do something. There may have to be a feud there. There's been a report that just came out that circulated that CM Punk pitched himself to be part of blood and guts and be that fifth member in the blood and guts storyline on the side of the BCC. Well, what do you think of that? Do you think that can work? Do you think they should explore that? Because it sounds like it was pretty quickly turned down. Um, and it sounds like Tony Khan is going with keeping these two groups separated, at least for now. And it's going to be a hard separation. Like you said, it, it would draw. It would be interesting. I don't know who you have go over in that case, but I think that really, as a booker, puts you in a bit of a tough spot. But do you think that CM Punk should maybe be considered for the Blood and Guts storyline? Maybe. And it's good to hear that uh, Moxie would be into it. But... Uh... I don't know. I'm curious. I don't know if Moxley was. CM CM Punk proposed it. I don't know if Moxley's into it because Moxley does not like that guy. Yeah. See, I don't know. The the report was that he just, he proposed it. He he did it. The the way the report phrased it, he did it almost kind of tongue in cheek, but 
if they were serious about it, he'd be serious about it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So he just kind of threw it out there and we'll see what the reaction in the room was. Yeah, it could work. Yeah. Uh, definitely wouldn't see a problem with it. But uh, again, I just, uh, I find it interesting in regards to CM Punk and it doesn't feel like they're still optimizing how they're using him. That's just where we're at. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with you. I, it, like he's in this Owen Hart tournament thing. I, I think we all believe he's winning it. There, there's really no intrigue here. So it is, it is kind of what it is. That all that being said, I think on Dynamite we are getting some some dynamite, pun intended, uh, programming. I think we've got two things that that are really interesting and two storylines that are working very very well. I think the Elite versus BCC, and now you fold in the Dark Order, which you also got to see a little bit. If you watch Rampage, you got to see the Elite taking on Dark Order. I think you got you've got a, a great storyline here. We talked a little bit about this last week, and I think this week on both Dynamite and on Rampage, they help continue that story, and I think that is fantastic, and I'm really into that. But you also have MJF and Adam Cole, and you have their bromance. I think with this, this is kind of the, 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 other, the other layer to what you get on Dynamite, right? There, there's always a little bit more on Dynamite. I think that's what kind of helps carry that programming and makes it better. MJF and Adam Cole... One, MJF does a really good job kind of playing comedic, comedic, satire-y, sarcastic roles. He does a really good job in this. And Adam Cole is doing a really good job of playing the straight guy in all of this. And I think what you're seeing here is you've got MJF really trying really, really hard with Adam Cole. And Adam Cole, at first, being very apprehensive and saying, no, 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 I don't want to buy into this. I don't even like you. But I think as time goes on, Adam Cole starts to kind of give in a little bit to MJF. And I think in the end, they're going to form a pretty good tag team. Obviously, these are two of the biggest stars that Dynamite has, so it only makes sense. Also, these are two of the best wrestlers in the world, so it only makes sense. But I think you're going to see a bit of a character shift, and it's going to be under MJF's influence, and Adam Cole may turn a little bit more heel. I want to get your perspective on what you're seeing with this MJF Adam Cole bromance, and are you as into it as I am? Yeah, a lot of people are. It's interesting to see. Obviously, many people kind of don't like the fake positive MJF. We've seen it before. But I think he's hilarious. I think he's so funny. It's hilarious. It's funny. It's it's just again, it, that's something that is always needed: is some intrigue, some wondering of what's going on here. Could this work? I I, I think the funniest thing in AEW right now is when you see. MJF trying to do the boom with Adam Cole. It just looks funny with him on the bottom there and, and Adam Cole going like, what the hell is this? So it's interesting and it's just playing up more facets of MJF's character that are really positive and, and fun to, to tap into. His uh, his ability to pan and dead deadpan shit is, is, is very funny and, and makes you want to watch. Yeah, I think it's great. Uh, was there anything else from, from Dynamite, Rampage, or even Collision uh, anything that AEW did this week that really, really sparked with you, really, really got you kind of going, got you geared up? Um, was, was there anything else that you wanted to kind of add to that conversation? Um, I'm definitely interested in how Blood and Guts is going to play out. I'm interested uh-huh. in, in how Chris Jericho's, you know, character continues to evolve. I like seeing the. You know what? Hold on. Can I, can I pause you? Let me pause you right there, real quick. And yep. I'm sorry. Uh, the 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 addition of Chris Jericho and, and Don Callis. Yes. So speaking of blood and guts, that 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 right there makes me think that Chris Jericho could be involved in blood and guts yep. again. Yep. For what I believe would be the third year in a row. Yep. Um. What's your thought on that? Because it does sound like Kota Ibushi is going to be the addition for the elite. He will be uh, – Kota. for those who don't know, uh, Kenny Omega and Kota Ibushi were once a tag team called the Golden Lovers uh, in New Japan. They work fantastic together. They are best friends. Kota Ibushi is an incredible, incredible wrestler. Him being worked in, if he is the fifth member, and it sounds like he is the fifth member, uh, is going to be awesome. It'll be great. But what what's your take on, on possibly – Chris Jericho joining the BCC and being their fifth member. <laughs> See, that's always interesting, the interwoven nature of, of, of these kind of things and who joins who for support at different times, right? Look, Chris Jericho yep. obviously passed his prime, obviously a little bit slowed down, but his involvement is always interesting and intriguing because of what he can say on the mic. His in- involvement always makes stars. It just for whatever reason... When people are in the ring with him, people really like it, and it ends up becoming something better than than w- without his involvement. So I'm curious to see. Chris Jericho could sell sand in the desert for sure. Yep, yep. So I'm sorry, I did not mean to did not mean to 
uh, interrupt you there. It just That's you it. brought that up and like instantly it clicked in my head. This is yeah. something that I had a thought about as it was uh, un- unfolding on Dynamite. I just did not add it to the to the rundown. So I just want to get your quick take on it. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else for you that caught your attention? Uh, really, no. It's just trying to figure out who these fifth members are for for Blood and Guts, and it's honestly for me. It is these two storylines. It is the MJF Adam Cole storyline, and it is the Elite versus BCC versus Dark Order storylines that really have me captivated and interested. Uh, I'm really into both of them. And it's because of that that I'm going to give my point this week for show of the week to Dynamite. Uh, what, what, where, where do you want your point to go for, for show of the week? Yeah, I agree. I think Dynamite was spectacular and had an opportunity now to move things along. And they really did themselves well for, for a Wednesday show. Awesome. You want some news and notes? Uh, I've got quite a bit to tell you about SummerSlam and the card. Hit me with this week's professional wrestling news and notes. What made your list? So the SummerSlam card is taking shape as we leave Money in the Bank, and it's in our rearview mirror. Uh, SummerSlam will be here in Detroit at Ford Field on August 5th, 2023. And Dave Meltzer is reporting a few scheduled matches we should expect. The first of those matches comes directly out of Money in the Bank's main event involving the Bloodline as we'll get Roman Reigns versus Jey Uso on Friday night. You kind of got to see the build for that. Uh, Jay pinned Reigns in their tag team match on Saturday, so it's likely that the explanation for him earning a title shot at Reigns uh, undisputed WWE championship will come from that as well as the beatdown and the uh, the wanting revenge for what happened to Jimmy Uso also planned for SummerSlam off the back of money in the bank is the intercontinental championship Gunther versus Drew McIntyre after McIntyre re- returned and confronted uh, Gunther on Saturday as well as uh, on I believe it's on SmackDown. Um, sorry, I'm getting my, my, my belts and my shows crossed up here. Uh, another championship confirmed to be on the card is WWE's Women's Championship, which will be Asuka defending against Charlotte and Bianca in a three-way. I don't think anybody's surprised about that. Sticking with the women's division, Shayna Baszler turned on Ronda Rousey at Money in the Bank, and their match is planned for SummerSlam as well. It's expected that Rousey will be leaving WWE soon, as she wanted a feud with Baszler before she left. Um, it has actually been the plan all along and the intention was to do a proper build and then to split them up instead of it being out of nowhere like it was. But because of that delay, uh, when them winning the tag teams earlier this year and due to Rousey's injuries, they basically ran out of time and just kind of had to rush to get all this done before she goes. We kind of talked about that a little bit earlier. And then, uh, there are two more matches that we, that we known about for a while, uh, one is Cody Rhodes versus Brock Lesnar, which we've talked about, and Trish Stratus versus Becky Lynch. Also sounds like Logan Paul has a planned match at SummerSlam, and it's going to be against Ricochet. Uh, Dave Meltzer describes Paul's planned match as an in-ring showcase. They're trying to build off of that. There was a botched move in the men's money in the bank where Ricochet went to go do a Spanish fly and basically drove Logan's Paul's head through a table. Um they kind of slipped on the rings. It was just kind of a, it was going to be a tough, tough move to pull off and they tried pulling it off and it just didn't work. And that's going to be kind of the take on all of that. Uh, and late this week, it sounds like plans for Rhea Ripley are to take on Raquel Rodriguez. Still plenty of big names still to be added to that show, including WWE's world heavyweight champion, Seth Rollins, uh, the rest of judgment day. You've got the United States champ, Austin theory, You've got uh, tag team champions, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, and a few others like Edge who returned to SmackDown this week. So still a lot of people to kind of fill out that card. It already sounds jam-packed. It might be one of those six-hour wrestling events, uh, which we could be in store for here in Detroit. Uh, the bloodline, This Bloodline family member was booted from TikTok. Despite boasting a 1.3 million followers and 7.6 million likes, Roman Reigns has been banned from the popular social media app TikTok. But why did he post something vulgar or disrespectful? Did he break copyright laws? No. TikTok has a strong policy regarding posting videos that include simulated violence. Many have hypothesized that this is why the official account got banned. He probably posted something regarding wrestling. Wrestling looks violent. So there you go. Roman did respond to TikTok like only the head of the table can with a video caption. You can't get rid of me. And now he's back on TikTok. TikTok. Uh, Injury news coming out of AEW that may impact a major angle and match on this week's Dynamite, just two weeks shy of his planned involvement in this year's Blood and Guts match on July 19th. Wheeler Yuta suffered an injury. The injury occurred in Dynamite's main event between Kenny Omega and Wheeler Yuta, 
with Yuta reportedly coming out of the match with a hamstring tear, according to Dave Meltzer's Wrestling Observer newsletter. The current belief is that it's not a full tear, so the hope is that he can still compete in blood and guts. Meltzer writes, Wheeler Yuta suffered a hamstring injury in the match with Omega on 7-5. Right now, the belief is that it's not a full tear, that he'll be able to return on 7-19 for blood and guts in Boston. The BCC already lost out on Brian Danielson's involvement in blood and guts due to a broken arm suffered at Forbidden Door against Okada. As well as the BCC, the elite are also left with a spare space for their team for the match. Hopefully this doesn't impact him or the match too much. We'll have to kind of wait and see. Don't count on Wheeler Yuta wrestling the next couple of weeks uh, as he kind of nurses that hamstring. But that's going to do it for this week's wrestling news and notes. Make sure you follow Adam on Twitter at AdamRSJROZ. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. What a beautiful hour we just spent recapping the world of wrestling. Always enjoy the banter, the debates. Always enjoy wrestling gifs. Always enjoy the wrestling content as each performer tries to get themselves over. L.A. Knight doing his thing, getting himself over. You got stars being made left and right in WWE. And look, it's crazy. You look at the world of wrestling right now, and it's hot. It's on fire. Multiple shows, multiple angles, so much to get into, and we always enjoy breaking it all down. Each and every week on the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast, anywhere that you listen to your favorite audio content, type in three words, Detroit Sports Podcast, and our content will find you. Make sure you get in and interact, and make sure you feel free to hit us up at Detroit Podcast or at Adam R S C R O Z. And we'll enjoy the weekly banter and digging into the world of professional wrestling. Podcasting time is over. Can't wait to catch up with all of you next week on the latest edition of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast.